Good morning. Please join in the call to worship. We worship the God who inhabits our world and indwells all our lives. We need not look up to find God. We need only look around, within ourselves, beyond ourselves, into the eyes of another. We need not listen for a distant thunder to find God. We need only to listen to the music of life. The words of the children, the questions of the curious, the rhythm of a heartbeat. We worship God who inhibits our world and indwells our lives. Friends, we have come to this time, the first Sunday after Epiphany, Martin Luther King Sunday, to ponder the dream, the mountaintop vision of King, the vision of the promised land for all of God's people. It is a vision of forgiveness and reconciliation, a vision of justice. It is a vision that is still alive in our world and so needs to be. It is a vision that comes to us as we offer the good confession before God and one another. Join with me in our prayer of confession. Most holy and merciful God, we have condemned racial injustice in our pronouncement, yet we cling to the privileges derived from social inequities. Too, too often we are blind to our complicity in maintaining systems of oppression and deferring the hopes and dreams. Give us the courage to name our sin. Give us the strength to claim responsibility for our actions. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. And let us continue our confession in silence. Hear now, my friends, the good news of the gospel. In our baptism, we are reminded that in God's love, we truly know love, that in God's mercy, we truly know mercy. Receive now the love, the mercy, the very life of God, knowing that it is a life of abundance. And please stand if you are able.
and be restored to right standing with God and one another. And here again, the commandment of Jesus, love the Lord your God with, <clears throat> with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Let us now join together in our response to our confession and assurance of pardon. <laughs> Let us remain standing and affirm what we believe using the words of a brief statement of faith which can be found on page 38 of your hymnal. We will be using the fourth selection from this statement of faith which begins, we trust in God, the Holy Spirit. Let, let us join together. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. Us by grace through faith sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor and binds us together with all believers into the one body of Christ the church. The same spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life through Christ through scripture, enables us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism and feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. In a broken, in gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily task and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come, Lord Jesus. The first lesson this morning is from John 2, verses 1 through 11. You can follow along on page 87 of your pew Bible. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana, Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the, the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water, that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called to the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the, God, of the Lord.
In the name of Christ, I'd like to invite the children to please come forward. And as you come forward, and the adults, you could put this in your head, think about who your hero might be, especially if you have a hero of faith. You guys, come on up. Are you coming? <laughs> but you know me. <laughs> Hi. You guys know Christopher, right? This is the first time he's up here without dad. So we'll see how this goes. So do you guys have any heroes? Do you have any heroes? Anyone that's living that you look up to or not living anymore from the past, from history? Do you guys have any heroes? Do you know what a hero is? So someone you might follow, someone you might trust, someone who sets a good example. Maybe your parents or your grandparents or your teachers or a famous person maybe. Do you guys know what tomorrow is? Monday. Monday. And it's, good job, Frederick. And it's Martin Luther, King. Luther King's birthday. And he was a great hero. And he is a great hero. He was a man of faith. He was also a pastor. And he followed God to make lots of good change in the world, to fight for people to be equal, no matter where we come from and no matter what we look like. So I have this story to share with you. And then for the rest of January, we're going to talk about our heroes in faith. So people who follow God, who are heroes, and help us learn and challenge us onward. So this is Dr. King. Does he look familiar? Okay. On August 28, 1963, March on Washington, Martin Luther King Jr. delivers, I have a dream speech. And he said, on buses they came, on trains they came, in cars they came, on planes they came, on foot they came to march. Can you march with your feet? Move your feet up and down. With blisters on their feet they came, with purpose in their step they came, with strength in their spirit they came, with hope in their heart they came to march. Okay, I want to see those marching feet. March, 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 thank you. Old faces. I'm the old face. Young faces, black faces, white faces marched. Marching feet. And they gathered and they listened. Standing small beneath Lincoln, standing tall above the crowd, one voice speak, spoke. I have a dream and the world listened. So I want you guys to think too about what your dream for peace might look like. We're gonna pray, and then we're gonna go to worship play and talk about it. Akira, will you hold my hand? Will you hold your sister's hand? Okay, will you hold Christopher's hand? Will you hold your own hands? Let's, let's put our hands in our own hands, and we'll pray. Dear God, Dear God. thank you for peace. Thank you. Thank you for pushing us towards peace. Thank you for pushing us towards peace. Thanks for our heroes. Thanks for our heroes. These people of faith. These people of faith. Who followed you. Who followed you. Help us follow you too. Help us follow you too. In Jesus Christ we pray. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to walk to worship play, okay? Our second scripture lesson this morning comes from Psalm 36, 5 through 10 are the verses. I invite you to follow along in your pew Bible or simply listen for the word of God as I read these words from the psalmist. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. 
How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. This is the word of the Lord. At the annual meeting of the Society of Christian Ethics just a couple of weeks ago where I attended in Toronto, the keynote address was by a uh, religious scholar from Germany who said something so utterly simple and utterly profound that it, it brought me up short. He said that the axial moment of human history and the axial moment of human development is the moment of self-transcendence. <laughs> now I had to think about that for a second. It's such a simple thought. Self-transcendence. Transcending self to, to look at others. Transcending self to look at the world. He was suggesting that that's the axial moment, the pivotal moment of religion in history, but also the pivotal moment for every human being. A moment where we actually ponder not just ourselves, but others. When we can actually get out of ourselves, out of our skin, just a little bit to enter the skin of another person, the place of another person. It's an amazing thing when you think about it. And, and it's, it very much corresponds to another very simple statement uh, by the uh, ancestor of Presbyterians, John Calvin, in his magnum opus, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, perhaps two of the most important volumes ever written. He begins with an utterly simple statement. He says that all knowledge, all true wisdom are two. Knowledge of self and knowledge of God. <laughs> Seems pretty self-evident, doesn't it? But then he goes on to explain. If we ponder ourselves very deeply for very long, then our eyes will ascend into the heavens from whence we have come to ponder God. And then he goes on to say that to ever truly know ourselves, we have to ponder the face of God in whose image we have been created. And then later in book two of the Institutes, he expands on that just a bit when he says that to really understand who we are, the height to which we have been created, the nobility in which we are created, we have to ponder the heights of God to understand the depths to which we have fallen. But to really understand the depth to which we have fallen, we must rise again to ponder the nobility of the image in which we are created. For the two are necessary. The two are a part the two are a part of what it means to live. In fact, what Calvin says is, is that grace precedes sin. Did you know that? Grace precedes sin. To even know sin, we, we have to ponder God and God's gracious gifts to us. To even know the depths to which we have fallen, to even know it, to even ponder it deeply, we have to ponder the grace to which we have been called. Now, I think in a different way, albeit, Martin Luther King has something similar to say, certainly in the march to Washington, when at the end of the march, he left the script to say this, by the way. He left the script to say, you know, in, in, my, in spite of the present difficulties that we are in, I still have a dream. I still have a dream that every valley shall be lifted up and one day, one day, whites and blacks and browns, Jews and Catholics and Protestants, and I think today he would say Muslims, will rise up by the power of the Spirit to say free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, 
We are free at last. And in a very similar vein, uh, on the night before he was assassinated, it was again a departure from the script when he said, my friends, I have been to the mountaintop. I have been to the mountaintop, and while uh, long, longevity has its place, and uh, everybody should like longevity, uh, I'm not thinking about that now. I'm thinking about doing the will of God, and I've been to the mountaintop, and I've seen the other side. I have seen the promised land. Now, what I want to suggest to you this morning is this, that all of those examples are of a piece they are of a piece of the examined life. They are of a piece of what it means to do self-transcendence, to what it means to ponder the height to which we have uh, been created and which we are called and restored in order to understand the depths to which we have fallen. They are all of a piece of understanding the dream that God has given for us all, of understanding the mountaintop and the vision of the promised land beyond it. They are a piece of what I call the examined life, the examined life, for without examination, as uh, the quote attributed to Socrates suggests, the unexamined life is not worth living. It's what I call the contemplative. I've been talking a lot about that late, of late. In fact, I've talked about it in most of my ministry, and I know that some people have a terrible misconception of what that is, the contemplative. The contemplative, I think, some people think is just navel-gazing or self-indulgence or something like that. And, you know, I, I can understand how people feel that. I can understand how people would have a, a conception of that because, I mean, after all, spirituality now is relegated to the uh, self-help uh, section of the bookstores. And if you Google spiritual, if you Google spiritual, the, the contemplative or anything like that, it will take you to sites that are more like the therapeutic or something like that. But I would contend to you that the contemplative is the opposite of the self-indulgent. It is the very opposite. In fact, it's the remedy. It's the examined life. It's to move to the mountaintop and to peer to the other side. It's to dream the dream that King had for us all. The dream, the dream that God gave to King. It's to ponder the heights to which we are created in order to understand the depths to which we have fallen and are being redeemed. As Wendy Farley says, the contemplative is about shattering the self-indulgent. It's about getting us out of ourselves to see others fully, to ponder others fully. That's why I'm a big advocate of the uh, contemplative. Um, that's why I, I encourage it because it's, it, it's, it's, it's about the lifeblood of everything we're about. It's about visions. It's about going to the mountain and seeing the other side. You see, Martin Luther King was a contemplative. He was. He was a mystic in his own right. Uh, little known but true, he was a follower of uh, Howard Thurman, and some of you know some of the writings of Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman was a pre-reformer. He was a pre-civil rights figure who uh, worked in the 20s and 30s and 40s, established the very first um, multi-racial uh, church in San Francisco. He was a dean at Howard Divinity School, but he was a mystic first and foremost. Howard Thurman had a mystical vision of God and what human life can be before God, and it got him out of himself and his dilemma to envision a different world. He wrote an article, a profound article, entitled The Socialist, the Socialist Project and Mysticism. And in that, in, that, in that article, he says, the socialist progress is a very, very good thing, but without mysticism, without a full embodiment of the vision of God, for all of who we are, the socialist project will fall short. And this is what he said. He said, the vision of God, this mystical vision of what God has given to us, says this to us, wherever there is poverty, then I am poor. Where there, wherever there is a criminal, then I am a criminal. Where there, wherever there are jails, then I am not free. It is that mystical vision of the interconnectedness of all of life before God that every justice seeker needs. 
Otherwise, it does seem to me that justice seeking is only a matter of patronage. It's only a matter of inflicting our own egos upon something else, our own indulgences upon others. In fact, to really see with mystical eyes, to really see what King saw, what Thurman saw, what the prophet saw, what Jesus saw, who was, in my mind, also a contemplative, is to see it every human being, a child of God, in every human being, in every human being, the Christ in the other. And don't you see, this is what self-transcendence is about, is to get out of ourselves to see what God wants us to see, to feel what God wants us to feel, and to do what God wants us to do. This is the essence of what the psalmist was trying to get at when the psalmist says, in your light, O God, we see light. It is only in the light of God that we can see, that we can truly see the height to which we have been created and the depths to which we have fallen and been restored in Christ. It is in the light of God that we gain the sense, a sense of who the other is as a child of God, precious, created for nobility. In the John text before us, the uh, wedding at Cana in Galilee, Jesus makes uh, 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 this, this vast quantity, this abundance of wine so what's that about? Um, interestingly enough, John doesn't call it a miracle. He calls it a sign. And what it is, is a sign of the new age. It's a new age of the fulfilling of all that God has in mind for all of God's people. And did you know that in John's gospel, Jesus only gave us one commandment? To love one another as I have loved you. So that abundance of wine is a kind of intoxication of love. It's an intoxication that flows so abundantly through the life of Christ. It is, flows so abundantly. If we can only find the space, just a little space to ponder it deeply. On this Martin Luther King Sunday, did you know that one of his most famous books was simply entitled The Strength to Love? And what he says about that is, is that if we can transcend our circumstances enough just to love, just to love a little, we could stand against the forces of evil in our society and they shall not overcome. So ponder it with me. Become contemplatives, mystics. If you have guilt, go to the mountaintop. Anxiety, fear, disappointment, I have it too. Discouragement, yes, go to the mountaintop and ponder deeply the promised land that King saw. Ponder it deeply. Ponder the love in which we were created, the height, the nobility, the nobility in which we have been restored in God and then live into it. Amen.
may be seated. Welcome again to worship at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. If you would please take the friendship pads, fill out your names and your contact information, especially if we do not have it, pass it down the pew, and then greet each other during the peace and after the service. If you are visiting with us, or if you've never taken the tour, there is a tour of the history and ministries of this church following the service. It meets right here in the front by the Lincoln Pew. You're also invited to coffee time and snack fellowship in the back as you leave. If you come before this service, you are welcome each week to our Sunday school classes. We have three going on right now. We have Adventures in Prayer in the Lincoln Parlor. We have Theology 101, and this is an intergenerational class. Next week, we'll be talking about the church. And we have Transfiguration Movement, so it's a class to prepare for a dance of movement for worship on Transfiguration Sunday, February 7th, and that meets up on the fifth floor. Tomorrow, in honor of Dr. King, we're having a half day of service here um, from 10 to 2. If you would like to participate or just come to lunch, um, you are welcome to do that. And if you'd like more information, please email me. I'm Alice, and I'm in the bulletin. Um, we have some young adult Bible studies forming. Um, the one is happening this Tuesday evening, January 19th, from 5.30 to 7, and we'll meet in the library or the Doherty Center. Starting next week, January 24th, for three Sundays, we will have our inquiry to membership classes. So if you or maybe a friend you know has been thinking about joining the church, come or send your friend, and we'll talk about church and church life here and our faith for three Sundays. And the classes are very good. We get to share our faith stories with one another. Do we have any other announcements? Well, I encourage you to continue to read all of the rest in the bulletin here. There are many more. In gratitude for all that God has given us and continues to give us, we continue this service of worship by receiving our tithes and our offerings.
line in the prayer of dedication. O God, God who has created, created your children to be free, we be attest in word and deed that you are our God and we and are we your are people. people. From, From our, our earliest days, you have called forth from self-seeking bondage, comfort, and complacency, to freeing and redeeming action for justice everywhere in the world. At every turn, we hear your voice in the cries of the poor, the hungry, the imprisoned, and the broken, for you have made yourself one with those who seek justice, freedom, and peace. We pledge ourselves to now pursue relentlessly that living, breathing justice that transforms persons and people. To your will, justice, we recommit ourselves and pledge ourselves funds and actions through Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We come to our time of prayer as a congregation. I have two joys to announce. First, prayers of celebration and congratulations to Kristen and Matthew Ford, whose son William Matthew was born on January 11th. Here is his rose. Um, the address in the care prayer list is 211 Castro Street, not 2211. So if you would like to send them a note of congratulations, it's 211. We also have the joy of announcing that to parents Carrie and Stefan Reasonover, their son was born last night, uh, so they are still in the hospital recovering. Um, their son is named Stuart Keanu, and he was eight pound. He is eight pounds one ounce, and we welcome him to this world. What other prayers do we have to share as a congregation? And I'll start in the back, and I'll come forward. Karen. Um, had a surprise double mastectomy um, two weeks ago. So keeping her and her, her three kids in our prayers. Prayers for Sam. Prayers for Sam. A co-worker who had a double mastectomy and prayers for her family during this time of recovery. Joe? And again, for two buddies of mine who's, uh, who's uh, I was with them, their industry friends last Sunday, and both of them shared that uh, both their dads have got Parkinson's disease right now, and one of them has also got Alzheimer's on top of it, which is pretty tough. And then I, it just dawned on me, my neighbor two doors to the north of me uh, died yesterday, and I wonder if we, my neighbor Greg, and I wonder if we'd pray for his wife, Liz. Prayers for Joe's um, friends and neighbors during this time of grief. Appreciate it. What other prayers do we have? Yeah, Emily? Um, one of my coworkers, Debbie, her mom passed away over the holidays, so for her and her family. We pray for one of Emily's coworkers, Debbie, whose mother passed away over the holidays for their family. Laura? I just really appreciate prayers for my daughter, Caroline, who's had some health issues, and she's in Ecuador, so it's kind of far away for me. Prayers for Caroline as she recovers and she heals. Yeah. Thanks to God that Florence Joy Burke could join us today. She's a seven to niner and a longtime friend of mine. Thanks for the presence of Florence Joy Burke, who is here in worship with us today. Any other prayers? So a, a joy and also continued prayers of health as Adam and I expect our first child in July. <laughs> um, and then just in the midst of our great joy, we continue to hold close uh, and hold in prayer those who want to be parents and are, are finding that a difficult journey. So thanks, Whitney. Let us continue our hearts and our minds in prayer. God of all nations and races, we pray to you and give you thanks for all of your servants who have done justice, loved mercy, and walked humbly with you. 
Especially this day, we thank you for the witness and presence and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for his courage and his, for his conviction and his passion for peace. We give thanks too for the countless others who stood in the front lines and marched, those who integrated schools, those who participated in freedom rides and the march here on Washington, who sat on buses and refused to move, for those who stood for the right to vote, and for the multitudes who suffered the tortures of slavery and the tyranny of oppression whose lives were stunted and cut short by human-made structures of brutality. God, we give you thanks today for those who continue to stand up for your justice, for your dignity and equality for all, those who have strived to live lives dedicated to peace, we pray for those who in this country fear their own safety at home, on streets, and at school. We pray for a healthy environment for all, where all are considered to be your beloved child. We pray today also for those suffering from terror and the desolation of war, and who live in fear. For those especially this week suffering after the Jakarta attacks, and for the thousands of places and people in our hearts and prayers. We pray for those escaping violence on uncertain and often fatal journeys. We pray for an end of children dying of hypothermia as they travel across Europe, an end to people drowning, and an end to all immigrants, migrants, and refugees being housed in conditions less than where we ourselves would want to live. We pray that all people may know peace and security, life free from bombs, life free from gun violence, and a life of peace and love. God, and we pray for ourselves, for those in this church, in this community, both in thanksgiving and in celebration, and in asking for your healing and guiding presence. We give thanks for healthy new babies born, for Stuart Keanu and for William Matthew, and to their proud parents, Christian and Matthew, Karen, Carrie, and Stefan. We pray for all new life coming into this world and all new life wanted, that you would bring wholeness to us all. God, we pray for healing for this congregation, especially for Stan, our minister of music, um, recovering from minor eye surgery. We pray that you would continue to bless the Sieber and Nolbert family as they grieve the loss of Marilyn's mother, Marion Brown Crosin Sieber. We pray that you would support their family. We are grateful for your presence in the lives of so many as they recover, especially for Lenora Thierry, for Annie Toole, for Sherry Aitel, for Louise Law, Betty Osborne, Elaine Foster, and Susie D. Concini. God, we pray for all of those who are sick and those who minister to those who are sick, those who grieve and minister to those who grieve. We pray too for the guests who come to our Radcliffe Room ministry, that they might find friendship and hospitality, warmth and security in this church. We pray that this church may be a beacon of light for all of those in need, those with physical and economic needs that are so transparent, and those of us with less transparent needs, oftentimes just as desperate. We pray that we might shine your light bright for all the world to see, that we may have the courage and strength to stand up for your justice and for your way of peace, that in love and grace and in faith in you, each and one of us may work to change your world. May we find the strength to do what, we must, what must be done, encouraged to live our lives full of conviction, of spirit, and of faith. May we know your justice and your peace as we pray the words you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Let us pass the peace and joy of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you today. Go from here with visions and dreams and lift up the brokenhearted. Stand with the oppressed and let all that you do, all of it, be in love. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.